a planet found at Alpha Centauri in the habitable zone. Webb revisits the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Little red dots don't break the laws of physics. And in Space Bites Plus, showing that the Earth's magnetosphere was here for a long time. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. We know that there are planets orbiting around the red dwarf star Proxima Centauri. And this is the closest star system to our own solar system. That's fine. The planet that's in the habitable zone is probably tidally locked to the star. So and the star gives off a lot of flares. But what about Alpha Centauri? These are two sun like stars in a binary star system. And astronomers have been searching for planets in the Alpha Centauri system for quite a while. And finally, it looks like there's evidence of a giant planet orbiting around Alpha Centauri A. The discovery was made with the James Webb Space Telescope. Astronomers use the coronagraph on James Webb to block the light from the star, revealing the much fainter, probably Jupiter sized planet in orbit around Alpha Centauri A. And this is an even trickier observation because you've got Alpha Centauri B very close by also producing a lot of light. And based on these initial observations that were actually made about a year ago, Astronomers estimate that it is at about two astronomical units away from the star, and that puts it into the habitable zone of Alpha Centauri A. Now, it's a gas giant planet, so you can't live on the surface of a Jupiter like planet. But what about the moons that if it does have moons with the mass of Earth, and these could be in the habitable zone of Alpha Centauri A, and this could very much be like Pandora from the movie Avatar, which wasn't that set at Alpha Centauri. That's crazy. <laughs> the promotional campaign for the new Avatar has gone too far that 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 James Cameron went out and actually made a planet just so we would all be excited about it. Obviously, when the astronomers made this discovery, they were quite excited. And so they came back and did some more observations in February of 2025. And then again, in April of 2025, and they weren't able to see evidence of the planet. And so does that mean that it's not really there? Well, it's all just based on what is the position of the planet in orbit around the star when they took their images. They don't know exactly what the orbital period of this planet is. They made their best guess, but it could be on a very elliptical orbit, especially because it's in this binary star system with Alpha Centauri B. And so they're going to have to do many more observations and try to figure out the timing of this planet to see if it is truly there. Or maybe it's a mistake and it'll all go away and then we'll go back to we don't know if there are any planets around Alpha Centauri. But still, it's a pretty exciting development. Everyone's asking, when are we going to get the James Webb version of the deep field? This is where the Hubble Space Telescope was directed to stare at a small spot in the sky for hundreds of hours. And they produced this image that had tens of thousands of galaxies, some of which were seen just you know, less than a billion years after the Big Bang. And it's still going to be a few years before we get the James Webb version of the deep field. And that's just because this telescope is very, very busy. It's got a lot of priorities, but they have done a few sneak peeks of what a deep field might look like. In fact, when we saw first light from James Webb, we got an example of a bunch of galaxies demonstrating just what Webb can do when it stares at a spot for a long period of time. And now astronomers have gone and looked at one tiny little spot within the Hubble Ultra Deep Field Survey. And Webb was used to stare at this spot for 100 hours, which you know, on web time is a huge multiple of what you would normally get. And they were able to find 2500 individual sources in this tiny little field of view. And many of these are galaxies seen just a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. So this will just whet your appetite. We've got a longer story on Universe Today by Matt Williams, and he goes into more detail about how astronomers are cataloging the different objects in this image. So if you want more information, check that out. Buckle up, we've got more stories about James Webb. And this is an incredible image of the planetary nebula NGC 6072. Now a planetary nebula is what you get when a star like the sun reaches the end of its life, it becomes this red giant star and then collapses in and becomes a red giant and it 
puffs out its outer layers into these shells that then float away in space. And every planetary nebula looks a little bit different. And we aren't entirely sure if in fact, a star like the sun will produce a planetary nebula or does it require some kind of binary star system, because we see all of this variation in their shapes and sizes, and the different structures inside of it. And so with this one taken by James Webb, you're able to see what looks like a kind of a mess, just a gas dust mess. But when you switch instruments to the Miri instrument on board web, you can really see that it's more like this spider web connection of this gas and dust. And in fact, there's a central core region with glowing gas. And then there are these elliptical outflows that have this sort of multipolar configuration in this object. In the article version, we link to a lot more detail and shows you all the graphics. We're probably gonna have a bunch here in this video, but definitely check out the longer article by Matt Williams. The James Webb news continues. And this time we've got some more information on little red dots. And these were these weird, faint galaxies discovered by James Webb seen really out at the very limits of what it's capable of seeing. And these were surprising because you've got this very bright object at the center of this very compact object. It was immediately assumed that these are active galactic nuclei where you've got a supermassive black hole that is feeding on material. Now when this is happening, you get a range of electromagnetic waves coming from the supermassive black hole, you get the visible light, you get the infrared light, and you also get x rays and ultraviolet radiation. And that allows you to figure out just how much activity is going on at this supermassive black hole and astronomers using James Webb and other instruments like the Chandra X ray observatory were able to analyze these little red dots in different wavelengths. And what they found is that you get this light that has been redshifted into the infrared, but you aren't getting the associated X rays that are coming with this process. And for objects to be this bright this early, astronomers were wondering if we were seeing examples of supermassive black holes that were exceeding the Eddington limit. And so the way this works is that if you have a black hole that is feeding on material, it starts to get this accretion disk and jets that are coming out of the black hole. And this heats up the surrounding gas and dust in the area. And at a certain point, it heats it up so much that no more material is able to fall down into the black hole. It's essentially pushing away all of the additional stuff. So you know, it's fed, it can't eat anymore. And this is called the Eddington limit. And astronomers were wondering if these little red dots were actually exceeding the Eddington limit. But because they don't see x rays that are coming from these objects, that seems really unusual. And the only way that would work is if there was just so much dust surrounding this object, you could see the radiation coming out of it, but it was blocking the x rays that were showing that it was exceeding the Eddington limit. And so astronomers use other instruments to measure the amount of gas that's in the area around the black hole to find out well, if it is blocking the radiation, is it enough gas to block the radiation? What they found is that it doesn't. And so these are not black holes that are exceeding the Eddington limit, there has to be some other mechanism that is making them this bright this early. And if you want more details, we've got a great story from Dr. Brian Koberlein, who's an astrophysicist and is able to explain it very deeply. All right, that's enough James Webb news for today. But we've got some news on another amazing space telescope. And this is the Nancy Grace Roman telescope. Now, this telescope is under construction right now. And I've been talking about every single major building block. And in the last couple of weeks, Nancy Grace Roman got its solar panels slash sun shield installed. And these are the solar panels that are around the optics of Nancy Grace Roman. They're very thin, but provide all of the electricity and also help to keep the telescope cool. So now all of the core components of Nancy Grace Roman are complete. And so now they're going to take the telescope and they're going to put it into a vacuum chamber for 70 days to do a thermal vacuum test. Once that's complete, there's more testing, more things to be assembled, but we're moving towards this hopeful launch of late 2026, early 2027. So let's get there and get this next telescope up into space. 
We've got more information by Matt Williams. Every week we do a vote on our channel where you tell us what you thought was the best space news story of the week. And the winner this week was that a lunar telescope is ready to be tested on the far side of the moon. Thank you everybody who voted last week. We're going to put up the vote for this week in the post tab on our YouTube channel. So if you go check that out, you should see the vote. But if you're just scrolling, you should eventually see the vote show up. But if not, click on the subscribe click the notifications bell, and then just vote randomly on anything that you see. And that will tell YouTube that you really like votes. One of the most incredible missions in the last decade was the Ingenuity helicopter, which went to Mars as part of the Perseverance rover mission. Ingenuity almost made it to 100 flights before it finally fell over, cracked its rotors and was no longer able to fly. But it demonstrated without a doubt that we're ready for helicopters to fly on Mars. One of the subcontractors behind the construction of Ingenuity, a company called AV Inc., is proposing a new mission called Skyfall to really double down on this idea of helicopters at Mars. And they have decided there's no need for a rover. You just send helicopters. So their proposal is that you send a mission to Mars that enters the atmosphere, slows down with a shell, deploys a parachute, and then just deploys six ingenuity like helicopters into the atmosphere of Mars. They don't need a lander because they are a lander. And so they're able to use their rotors to get down to the surface of Mars, then recharge themselves and then just start exploring the surface of Mars like a pack of helicopters. And they think that because this is using the same technology as was done with ingenuity, that they could have this mission together very quickly, probably launching by 2028. And so we could see another mission going back to Mars with many more helicopters. We've got a story on Universe Today, and it includes a video that shows you the way the helicopters would be deployed as they come into the atmosphere of Mars. So definitely check that out. Astronomers have found thousands of exoplanets, and now we've found hundreds of free floating planets or rogue planets. And these are objects with about the mass of a giant planet like a Jupiter or a Saturn or maybe bigger. And these are just free floating through the Milky Way. And then one of the questions is, could you get a planetary system around one of these free floating planets? And the answer appears to be yes. Astronomers examined eight rogue planets with between five and 10 times the mass of Jupiter. And they found that six of these rogue planets have a dusty protoplanetary disk surrounding them. Now, this isn't concrete evidence that there are planets around this planet. Moons? Rogue moons? I'm not sure what you would call this. And the Webb Space Telescope was able to show that there are silicon grains in these dusty disks around these rogue planets. And these are the precursors to actual planets. So it looks like they're on the way to forming planets around planets. And we've got a longer story from Evan Goff. And on what I like about this story is it shows just the level of detail that the astronomers went into to prove that they're seeing these protoplanetary disks and these precursor molecules to get to larger and larger objects. If you're hungry for more space news, we've got many, many more stories on Universe Today just this week. So for example, dwarf galaxies like the Magellanic Cloud could actually have satellite galaxies of their own. Galaxies orbiting galaxies orbiting galaxies. We've got a story about that from Evan Goff. If you get up early in the morning before the sun comes up, you can see Venus and Jupiter in the morning sky. I actually saw Venus two days ago in the sky, so I can confirm this is real. And Dave Dickinson is our amateur astronomy writer, and so he's got detailed information about how you can find these objects in the morning and what cosmic dust can reveal about the Earth's early atmosphere, story by Evan Goff. Now, I am gathering together my weekly email newsletter that collects all of these stories and more. And I send it out by email on Friday. Like, you know, those AI summaries that you see on various things. Well, imagine that, but a human wrote them. Me. It's like that. It's completely free. I write every word. Go to universetoday.com slash newsletter to sign up. But if you do want some more space news, we've got a longer version of this exact same video, but with one additional story. And we call this Space Bites Plus, and it's completely for free. There's no ads in it. 
you have to watch it over on Patreon, and I will put a link in the show notes. And this week's bonus story is about how the Earth's magnetosphere probably formed a lot earlier than we were expecting, protecting the planet from cosmic radiation. We just wrapped up recording our patrons only question show and I'm going to give you some examples of what was in it. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew Gross, Bradley Kroofing, Brian Bodie, Cardwin, Chuck Hawkins, Commander Bielek, Cy Nelson, David Gilton, and David Mounts, Evan Pro, Greg Feely, Hudson Ward, James Clark, Jeremy Madden, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Marcel Smith, Michael Purcell, Monzo, Nick Borquez, Nick Solari, Paul Robach, Ren Kaidu, Robeck, Sean Sargent, Stephen Fowler Munley, Vlad Chiplin, and Wolfgang Klaus, who support us at the Master of the Universe level and all our patrons. All your support means the universe to us. As you know, we do a patrons only question show every month on our Patreon channel. And this is where I ask all of the patrons to send in their questions. Me and my producer Anton answer all of the questions that come in every time. And the shows just get longer and longer. And this one was about four and a half hours long that we recorded. I'm not sure what the final edit is. We should be releasing it in just a couple of days. But just to give you like a sneak preview of some of the kinds of questions. So people ask me how I manage my time. And so I sort of explained all of my various process and routines. Someone asked me, what is the architecture for the new version of universe today? How did I develop this, the new model that is so fast and yet very easy for the writers to use and, and, and did it all myself. I provide my recipe for the vegan chorizo sausage that I make on a regular basis. That is a big hit, even with carnivores. And of course, a lot of questions about space and astronomy. But of course, what's great is that these are questions from people who are very knowledgeable about space and astronomy. And so I'm able to go into a lot of detail, do a bunch of math. And we answered questions about whether James Webb would be able to see the first generation of stars and what it would take and what mission would be able to do it, which upcoming missions are going to be expected to be able to see the first Earth like worlds orbiting around a sun like star within the habitable zone. When will we actually see this happen? But those are just examples of the dozens and dozens of questions that we got. They get bigger and bigger every month, and it's super fun to do it. So if you're interested in more content, check out uh, our Patreon. And of course, we're doing a discount until the end of August where you get 57% off your first month of our Patreon. So check that out. Go to patreon.com slash universe today. All right, we'll see you next week.